Let's pray as we open the scriptures together. Lord God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the sure promises that we find here. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who guides us in truth, in all truth. And Lord, I pray that this time as we open your word together may be a time where your Holy Spirit ministers to our needs and to our, our very souls. Lord, we pray that your word may have liberty, that perhaps we might allow it liberty to instruct us. We might be willing to not just hear your word, but to, to determine to obey it. Lord, I pray that the word may be uh, something that, that we govern our lives by and we govern our thoughts by, and that we might align ourselves with this book and in doing so align ourselves with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been working our way uh, through soteriology as a, a course of study for a number of weeks now, months even, and today we pick up the topic of eternal security once more with a message with the title of Never Thirst, Never Hunger, Never Lost, Never Perish. And we need to get this right. It makes a big deal of difference in the life of God's children and we have seen last week the beginning and we will We'll continue today and then next time, and it'll be after Christmas now, we will start. Eternal security sounds good, but what about? All right, so we're, we're going to have to do that as well um, over the next month or so, but it's, it won't be a long-winded study, but we do need to address some things. This, I believe, is an issue worthy of our time regardless. It is eternal security. When we say that, we mean this, that those who have been genuinely saved by God's grace by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, faith alone in Christ alone. They will never perish. They will not come under condemnation. They will not go to hell. That's what we believe. Once saved, always saved. And people will fall on different sides of this fence. I'm surprised at how many people in Christendom today don't hold to this doctrine. I'm actually genuinely surprised because to me the Scriptures are quite clear and plain and obvious, but there are a large portion, um, more than we might really understand, of people in churches who who don't accept eternal security and in doing so they deny assurance, which are the two issues that I hold dear to. The eternal security of a believer and the fact that we may know that, and have that assurance that we're saved and that we're going to go to heaven. So those things to me are important for us. So the question I asked last week, is one saved always saved true or are we as Christians on divine probation? As in you're on your pee plates and if you mess up you, you lose your licence, all right? Is, are we on divine probation and is God ready to pull the rug out from under us? Is, is, that, is that where we stand? And some people, sadly, will hold to that. Um, the Bible says in, in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, I'm going to give you three quick quotes here. Um, the Word of God says, Titus 1, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, that's what I'm trying to get out here, in, in which the God, sorry, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God has promised some things and we're told here or reminded that God can't lie. It is a good foundation to begin with to know that our God will not deceive us. He won't lie. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 tells us this, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Have you fled for refuge to Christ? Are you laying hold on the hope that's set before you? And are you confident in that on the basis of the fact that God doesn't lie? I mean, this is where it, what it comes down to. If God's Word says it, He means what He says and says what He means and we can, we can believe that. So we need to just look at some of these things today. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Why? For He is faithful that promised. You see, God's faithfulness and His, and his faithfulness to His Word is the ground upon which we stand. We need to be careful that we don't, uh, I am not a perfect dad, no dad is, correct? Um, my own dad had flaws, Dave put his hand up, did we see that? <laughs> There's no earthly father that's perfect and as such we, we as children of an earthly father can often imprint upon our heavenly father the same imperfections that our earthly father had. Uh, I know that I am prone to anger. Right? And if I get my buttons pushed by my children, I feel that rush of blood and I feel the need to control my tongue and sometimes I don't control it as well as I ought to as a Christian. 
and you know what? My, my children might grow up thinking, well, if my dad's like that, then God the Father may be like that. That he may be may have a, a rush of blood and he might get angry and he might just go, well, bang, and just condemnation upon a child of God. No. So we can imprint our earthly father's imperfections on our divine heavenly father. And in doing so, we corrupt our concept of him. Uh, I have told a lie. You realise that? I've even lied to my children without sometimes meaning to. Sometimes I might have done it intentionally. I can't think of the reason or the account now, but I know I've, I've told lies. What if my children catch me in a lie? Oh, I can't trust Dad. You know, he says one thing and does another. Well, does God say one thing and do another? No. So we need to just get that right because our God is not like your dad. Chelsea, all right? Our God is not like your dad. And it's true for all of us. Our Heavenly Father is perfect. So what we see today, God's faithfulness to his promises demand eternal security of the saints. If he said it, he can't lie, then we can bank on that. They are ironclad promises to believers concerning the gift of life which we have received. We're going to look at a number of passages today, three main ones. Um, Firstly, the woman at the well. Secondly, the bread of life discourse where Jesus spoke to the multitude after the feeding of the 5,000 who followed him. And then lastly, the Good Shepherd passage we talked about today. So they're the three we're going to look at. And we're going to work our way through these passages and see exactly what Jesus says. And, and part of what we're going to do today is I'm going to wade into a little bit of Greek. It's going to be quite easy because I can't teach you any more than a little bit of easy stuff. All right? I'm, I'm not going to drag you into the depths. But I am going to show... Just one construction in the Greek that's repeated in most, if not all, of these passages here that adds to the intensity of the promise. We say he will never thirst. But in the Greek, it's much more emphatic than that. And I just want to show that to you. And you can go away and study that in your own time. But let's have a look in John 4 as we start with Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. Um, I'd like to read from verse 1, the verses we'll look at are verse 13 and 14, but just to set the scene, and I want to draw a couple of things out here as we read through. John chapter 4 verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptised more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptised not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Now what would the normal way for Jesus and any other Jew to go? towards Galilee, it would not be through Samaria. We we all understand that. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans, so they didn't go there. And the normal course would be to cross over the Jordan River to that side, to the the east, and then up, and then back. It it would not go through Samaria. But Jesus has different purpose, and in verse 4 it says, and he must needs go through Samaria. He had a purpose. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, I want to highlight this, being wearied with his journey. Did you get that? Sat thus on the well. We don't often picture Jesus wearied from journey because he is omnipotent. He he has all power, all strength, all capability. And for us to go, Jesus has been journeying and he's exhausted to the point where he's sitting on the side of the well, we need to recognise he's weary here. What does he need? He needs water to drink. Isn't that interesting? He's sitting there looking like a desperate man who doesn't have a bucket. He's sitting on the side of a well and the woman comes up and says, what does she say? Verse 7. Well, there's a bit there, no. Verse 7, There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest, wouldest have asked of him, And he would have given thee living water. He says, give me to drink. Can you use your bucket and get me something to drink? I'm weary from journey here. And he's using it as an illustration to reflect on her, exactly her desperate need. She needs water to drink that she doesn't recognize. She's got a bucket. She can bring up water. She can drink, but she's got to do it every day over and over and it doesn't satisfy. Jesus is there weary from journey, can't get the water out 
or he's choosing not to for whatever reason, she comes along and he says, please give me water to drink. It's a remarkable picture of his humanity, isn't it? He's showing human weakness here. But in reality, he's the son of God, omnipotent and omniscient, and he knows her, he knows her history, he knows her past, and he has the power to forgive sin. So this exchange is beautiful. Verse 13, oh, verse 11, the woman saith unto him, Sir, that thou hast nothing to draw with. You see what she's saying? You don't have a bucket. You can't quench your own thirst, is what she's saying. The well is deep, from whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Is that a, isn't that a loaded question? Are you greater than Jacob who dug the well? This man sitting by himself on the edge of a well without a bucket, weary from journey? Are you greater than Jacob who dug the well? Which gave us the well and drank him thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Are you better than, are you stronger than Jacob which provided for all of us? Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And praise the Lord, this woman says, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Now we can see what happens, you can follow the story, but the phrase I'm looking at here is that, that whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. There are three ways, three main ways that the Bible, that the Greek, three Greek words translated never in the New Testament, three main ones, and I'm going to give them to you here. The first is utipote, and it means never, all right? Not even at any time, and it is used for definitive statements, and I'll give you some examples. You know, the false teachers that come to Jesus, and then he says, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, that is utipote, never, not a chance. Then, and also in, in 1 Corinthians 13, the, the love chapter, charity never faileth, never, all right? Not even, cannot, not at any time. Hebrews 10 verse 1, the law can never make those who come to God by the law perfect, you, you know, never, that's utipote. Um, then there is another word, metapote, which it's, it means the same thing, but it's not as definitive and not as strong, okay? It's a less strong declaration. It's seen in 2 Timothy 3, verse 7, about those who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, okay? So that's an example of they won't, but it's not as emphatic as utipote. Then there's another one, utipo, which means not yet. And that's translated... You know, when Jesus was buried, and he was buried in a, a tomb in which no man had ever laid. Right? And the scriptures say this, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. Right? So, never yet is the way it's translated. So you've got these three ways. Never, emphatically, cannot. Never, but not quite as emphatically, and then never yet. So you ask, which way is it? You know, we've got never here in our John chapter 4. Which one of them is it? And it's really interesting. It's two. You know, if you want to say something strongly, you say it emphatically. And if you want to say it really strongly, you say it twice. And if you really, really, really want to say it, you, you know, you, you repeat yourself. There is a, a construct in the Greek called, if you want to write this down, you can. It's an ume construction. Right? Or you can just say that ten times over and memorize it. Ume. Utipote, metapote, u me. Okay? So the first little part of those words put together as a as a double negation. That's the, the end of your Greek study. Okay? That's that's as much as we're really going to do. But I want to highlight when this is used, because this is God's way in his word of emphasizing something so strongly that there's no room for wriggling. U me. A double negation. Linguistically, it's the strongest that can be seen. Now, Thyre, you know Thyre's Greek lexicon? He has this commentary about the use of ume together. Right? And I want to share this with you. U, Udipote, U, the first bit, denies the thing itself. While as me 
denies the thought of the thing. Now, you'll follow when I give you an example here. So, U denies the thing itself. It's very, very technical, absolute, categorical. It's objective denial. And then there's the may, which is denying even the concept or the notion of the thing itself. So, my example is this, and I warned Chelsea about this and she was not excited. Can I have a horse, Dad? No. No way, no how, no chance, forget about it. All right, you see the forget about it part? Deny the possibility of the thing. It's not going to happen. All right, so you follow me? Stop thinking about the thing that you want because it's not going to happen. So when Jesus is speaking about never thirsting again, he's saying you will never objectively thirst again and you won't even have to think about thirsting again. It won't be in your mind. It won't be an objective reality for you. It is as emphatic as you can get. Ooh, mate. But it's more than that. Because in our English translation, we don't have this. But do you remember last time, the word inos we talked about? Inos is the word for everlasting or eternal. No, you don't remember. It's too long ago. Inos, eternal, everlasting. You know here in verse 13, 14, verse 14, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Is Inos, all right? Everlasting life. But the word Inos is found in that verse already, so it's here twice. It's not in our English translation. You know where it's found? You will never, u de, sorry, u may, if I can get it right, ina, thirst. You will never, ever, forever thirst. It's as emphatic as you can get. The actual, the act of thirsting, the thought of thirsting, you will never for eternity thirst again. That's exactly what it says. And we go, why did they not put it there? I don't know. It's what's there clearly in the Greek. So my example for Chelsea is actually not good enough, is it? Because the chance is she might become an adult and rent a property with land or marry some fella off a farm. And she might actually have a horse. She could. So when I say no chance, never, you're not having a horse, forget about it, that's not even, that's not even a good illustration here because what Jesus says, you'll never thirst, forget about it for eternity. It's a full statement. There is no room for wriggling. And this isn't the only time that this construct is used. So, by the way, this woman clearly is going to have to drink water again, isn't she? We're not talking about, okay, now you never have to drink water. And even spiritually speaking, it's not as if this woman will never have to thirst after closeness with the Lord or a, or a practical holiness in her life as she struggles and wrestles with sin. I mean, is that not true? You as a believer, do you not thirst after practical righteousness in your life? Like Paul, he said, I do the things I don't want to do and don't do the things I should. He was thirsting after the right stuff. I mean, thirsting after righteousness in that sense is, is part of being a Christian. But thirsting after Christ's righteousness attributed to our account is a different thing altogether. Thirsting after being made right with God again will never happen ever again. Thirsting after a right standing with God or peace with God or justification by faith alone in Christ alone is done and you will never worry about it again. That's what it says. So why do we embrace the concept that we could? You have a decision to make. Are you going to believe that or not? Are you going to believe the word of God and the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ who cannot lie and build your life and your faith and your understanding of God and the way of salvation upon the Scriptures, or are you going to allow yourself to doubt, to listen to your favourite preacher who can be wrong, or are you going to listen to the Word of God? We must listen to the Word. Jesus said, and we talked about this verse last time in John 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. We're not going to unpack that verse again today. But verily, verily, it means truly, truly, doesn't it? It means amen, amen. And if we say it at the end of a statement, it means amen, let it be so, may it be fulfilled, think on that. That's what we mean when we say amen at the end of a prayer. 
when Jesus says it at the beginning of a statement, he's saying, surely, truly, of a truth. And he repeats it here for us. If God can lie, if God could say one thing and mean another, then how do we ever have any confidence in the word of God? But we know our God to be perfect and holy and righteousness. And he himself has declared in his word that he cannot lie. Jesus says, truly, truly, firmly is what amen means. Verily, verily, I say unto you. And when you read that, you know this is Jesus speaking and it's truth. Now, every time Jesus spoke, it was truth. But when he, when he prefaces a statement this way, he is setting it out as a truth that we, are, we ought to hold to. Shall you as a believer ever thirst again? For a right standing before God? No. Now that is settled. You will never have to come and draw the well. You will never have to somehow work your way into a right standing with God. That is done. That's what Jesus was explaining to the woman at the well. And I love the, the humanity that's on display, but also the authority of the, the God manifest in the flesh in that entire scene. Second example we're going to talk about as we move on is seen in John chapter 6. Here we find a a very strong verse proving eternal security. Jesus is speaking to a multitude of people who do not know him as saviour. You would agree with that? They'd eaten of the bread and the fishes the day before. They'd followed him out because he was a man who can do miracles. They followed him because they thought maybe he's going to do something for me. They ate and had their bellies filled. Jesus disappeared, crossed the Sea of Galilee. They followed around, caught up with him the next day, and they were trying to make him a king. You understand that? They wanted their bellies filled over and over and over again. You see the picture here? The woman at the well, thirsting, drawing water over and over and over again. And Jesus said, no, no, water that I have, never hunger, never thirst. Men craving sustenance for their belly. Oh, the bread. (laughs) Bread that comes down from heaven. You eat of this and you'll never hunger again. You see, this is the what he's using, the bread of life discourse. Now let's have a look at verse 26. We could read the whole, the whole kind of lead into it here of the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, but I think you know that. They came seeking him because they saw miracles in verse 26. They, he did eat of the loaves and were filled, but then in verse, oh, verse 26, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye, did, ye saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now, let's have a think about this and maybe jump down to verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye ye also have seen me and believe not. Now these verses together lay out the single condition for being made right with God. You, You come to him by faith, you believe on him. And then verse 36 makes that really clear because it says you, you've seen me but you don't believe. You've come out unto me but you don't believe. So here belief is set forth as the condition upon receiving the bread of life. Verse 35 is the verse we look at. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Ume is there again. Denying of the possibility, the idea itself, never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Twice over. Two, uh, what do we call them, double negations in the one verse. In verse 37, and if that's not enough, all right, You can read through and you just wonder how much more could God say to make this plain. But in verse 37, we see a a greater greater reason to be confident in, in our security. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So if you come to Christ by believing in him, you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst, and you will never be cast out. Is that not what it says? These double negatives, double negations are here in this verse as well. I will in no wise cast out. No, not ever. 
And you would ask, how much more could God do? Verse 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. What is the Father's will? That Jesus would lose none. Now, if Jesus is is capable of losing children of God, right? if if you can come by faith to the Lord and be made part part of his family, adopted into his family, and somehow be lost, you're making Jesus a liar to start off with because he said, if you come to me, I will not cast you out. I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of the Father who sent me. His will, verse 39, this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. So if you're a Christian who can lose your salvation, you're saying that Jesus can lose that which was given to him. And he can be disobedient to the Father's will. If the Father says, it's my will that everyone that I give you, will, you will not lose, But if you think Christians can get lost, Jesus can disobey God the Father. That's where it stands. That's what you're accusing God of. Because he said he would not. He will not allow us to hunger. He will not allow us to thirst. We will never be cast out. We will never be lost. No, the the whole lose nothing. He said, let's see if I can find the reference here. No wise cast out. Let's see. Verse 39. The Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. It's the same word that's translated back in verse 12 of the same chapter. Verse 12. When they were filled, this is the people filled with bread and filled with fish. He said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. So the day before, the disciples are going around picking up all the fragments, all the bits, and making sure that nothing's lost. And then he says, when he's talking about himself as the bread of life, if you come to me, it's my Father's will that nothing that comes to me will ever be lost. You won't be neglected or missed. You won't be laid aside. You will not be plucked from the the Son's hand or the Father's hand, which we're going to see shortly. You will not be lost. There There is a great illustration in that. And if it's not strong enough, what does verse 40 say? This is the will of him that sent me. See, this is the will of the Father, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. This confidence extends from the moment of faith right through until when? The resurrection of the last day, and then on for eternity, because it's a life eternal. This is the will of the Father that Jesus the Son is obedient to, speaking of the resurrection of the last day. We have wonderful confidence. These promises of the Lord stretch from the moment of salvation when we trust the Lord as our own Saviour, from sin and its punishment, sin and its penalty, sin and its power in our life, right through to the resurrection of this body onto eternity without end. I don't know how God could be clearer. But this is just one. Let's have a look at the Good Shepherd discourse over in John 10. John 10, and we won't read all of it. I, I mean, I appreciate George. Actually, thanks, George, for standing in and reading for us. You can follow the, the pattern or the, the context there in your own time, but we're going to jump in at verse 27 where Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. We'll read on because what we're going to see just intensifies. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. Is he greater than you? He is. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. There is so much here in what Jesus is saying. We're going to focus on the eternal security of a believer in this rather than kind of following some of the other things that Jesus introduces for us. But he is saying here that we will never perish. Verse 28, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never, ume, not, not, no way, no chance, no how, all right, there, there is no way that we will ever perish. You know the word 
You remember Inos, eternal, forever? It's here as well. The never here is Ume Inos, or Ume Ina, is what it is. And it means never, forever, for all of eternity, perish. You can't get it. You know, it's the same word when Jesus spoke of praying to the Father and, you know, the Holy Spirit coming. He said that the Holy Spirit would be the comforter. I'll send another comforter and he will abide with you forever. It's Inos, eternally. Spirit is in you forever. You know, by the way, this word Inos is used to describe hell too. Everlasting fire, everlasting hell, place prepared for the devil and his angels. Which, this is completely a side note, but if you believe like the Jehovah's Witnesses do, that once you die and go to hell, you are annihilated there, you're done, poof, cast into hell, suffer for a moment, annihilated, which is what the JWs think. You don't understand the scriptures or you are being intentionally, you're giving people a false hope. Maybe that's the reason they do it because it's more appealing to know that someone who's died outside of Christ and gone to hell is only there for a moment and then they're gone. But the scriptures teach that hell is a place of everlasting fire. Everlasting, everlasting God. Same word is used to describe God. It's used to describe our life. It's used to describe heaven and hell. It means eternal. It means forever. Verse 28, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Pluck means to seize by force. Um, it's used, actually we've got a lovely passage where this, ver- this word is used. It's the word harpazo, right? And it's used in 1 Thessalonians 4. You remember what that's about? All right. And we which are alive and remain. And we can turn there just for the fun of it though, or just for the encouragement that it is and in the light of the, the, um, the brevity of life, it's a nice reminder for us to be comforted with. But First Thessalonians chapter 4, except I can't find it. First Thessalonians 4.13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be, harpazo, caught up together with them in the clouds, plucked up, seized, taken away by force is what it means, right? To meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. See, here we rejoice in that catching away because it means that God's coming back to catch away his bride. Now, the warning, using the same word but the negative kind of concept, is an encouragement for us in John 10 where Jesus says, no man can seize you from my hand. No man can pluck you out. No no man can catch you away. This isn't the first time Harpazo is used in John 10. You know that? Have a look when Jesus is comparing the good shepherd and the hireling. Right In verse 11, maybe it is, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 12, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, harpazo, plucks them out, and scattereth the sheep. So when Jesus goes on and says, I'm the good shepherd, and no man's going to pluck you out of my hand, what's the context? It's the wolf coming to catch away the believer out of the security that he provides. Who's the wolf? Well, it's the devil and his workers. The devil himself, or those that would be his servants, preaching a false gospel, Um, seeking to lead souls astray, devil, demons, those that are are serving Satan. And they are seeking to pluck or catch away Christians and it says there that the hireling, and that's, that's directed at the religious leaders of the day, all right, who didn't care for the sheep. Jesus is presenting himself to be one who will lay down his life for the sheep and secure their safety, provide for them, protect them so that no harm can come to them. That's the context of no man can pluck you out of my hand. 
But it's not just Jesus' hand, is it? He says, my hand, and then he says, my father's hand. My father, which has given them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand, and and I and my father are one. You're doubly secure there in in the hand of the son and the father. So then we go. Oh, this is also an interesting observation. When Jesus is speaking about himself and his hand, verse 28, he speaks in the future tense. No man shall pluck them out of my hand. Do you see? When he speaks about the Father's hand in verse 29, no man is able to, present tense, take them out of my, my Father's hand. So your present tense and your future tense are both covered. That's good to know. It's good to know that you're secure today and you will be secure tomorrow. There's nothing that will change that. And either you believe that or you don't. And you talk to someone who holds to an Arminian concept of salvation and they'll say, well, that's true. I mean, we we are in the, the hand of the Son and the hand of the Father and they're not denying these verses, but then they say, well, but you can leap out. Have you ever heard that? I have. Yes, yeah, you're safe and secure while you remain there. But if you, if, you, if you jump out, then you're on your own. My Father is greater than all. If you can jump out, I would argue that you think you're stronger than God. He says, I'm greater than all and no man can pluck you out of my hand. And if you think you're going to jump out of that, I don't know what you think about yourself. I mean, what if we sin? And that's the argument. I mean, what if we sin and maybe it's the, the unforgivable sin or maybe it's habitual sin. What if we're in the Father's hand and we sin? Does God go, oh, I don't want you anymore? Is that his response? Does he go, oh, I, I wanted to hold you, but you are disgusting to me and I can't have you anymore? Praise God, that is not our Father's mind towards us as his children. Because we would all be done. (laughs) How much sin is enough to offend a holy God? And how much righteousness is needed to make him happy? Well, only Christ's righteousness, which is not on our, it's not on our, it's not on us. We receive it as a gift by faith when we trust our Saviour. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. What's the focus of John 10? Just if you do talk to people who believe that you can remove yourself from the Father's hand. What is the, what is the focus? Is it on us and what we do or is it on the good shepherd and what he does? I mean, the whole context of John 10 is clearly about God and what God does. I mean, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me. I lay down my life. Like I, it's all Jesus' work. And then for us to try and imprint upon that, this idea that, well, it's us and our work that somehow holds hands with God and we incorporate into this some concept of our own, you know, our own works, we're misrepresenting the theme of the whole chapter. God is holding us. But some people think it's like, well, God's holding us and we're holding God. And if we let go, then God lets go. And I say this carefully and I... I have a. I read this when I was reading through some commentaries here. Do sheep have hands? <laughs> no, not physically. Do, do, does a sheep that's been shorn in the Williamson's paddock have hands? It does not. What can it hold on? Well, it can probably bite on and latch on. But this concept of the good shepherd holding on to us and we the sheep holding on to him. I just, it's a comical picture, all right? It really is. But I read through this and go, who am I and what ability do I have to hold on to my God? Well, just like a sheep trying to hold on <laughs> with its hooves. It, it just doesn't work. Are you holding on to God by faith? Okay, what if you stop holding on by faith? What are you trusting in? Who are you trusting in? for your eternal life? Are you thinking that if you hold on tight to the Father's hand in your own strength, demonstrated with your obedience, 
Maybe that's your concept, but I would suggest the scriptures paint for us a picture of resting safely and securely in his protection by his strength so that none may catch us away. Let me show you one last one just before we close. And this is only a verse, Hebrews 13.5. And we still have the Lord's table, but I... This is just an extra verse, and there's a couple of these. The reason I turn you to this, this ume construct, the, the double negations is used here in, in Hebrews 13.5. And it's a verse we know well. I'd like for us just to, to see this. Hebrew, Hebrews 13.5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he, say, for he hath said, I will never leave thee. I will, u may, and I can't remember the word for leave. Ina, I think, no. I can't remember it right now. But I will never, ever leave thee, or, you know, u may. And then there's another nor for the word nor here in our English. U may forsake thee. So there's... Double negation, nor double negation. Never, ever leave, nor never, ever forsake. It's repeated here. In our English, we've got never leave, nor forsake, and we might miss the, the strength of the promise. just wanted to share that with you while we're thinking double negations because it's not something I'm going to preach on every week. But while we're in that mindset, just recognise that it's found there as well. So, believer... Can I tell you some things that we've seen today? You shall never thirst for a right standing with God because you have it. You will never hunger to be made right with God, to be satisfied. You have it. You will never be cast out. You will never be lost. Jesus will not lose one child of God because he is perfectly obedient to the Father's will and it's the Father's will that he doesn't lose any. You will never be lost. You are in Jesus' hand, safe. You're in the Father's hand, safely. And Jesus says, I and my Father are one. And lastly, we saw it here. God will never, no, not ever leave you, nor will he ever, no, not ever forsake you, according to what we see. But do you believe this? I trust you do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our time today in your word and pray that you might reinforce our, our confidence in you and when we come to some verses later in our course of study uh, that may challenge some of these foundational things, I pray that we would be discerning and wise and, and, uh, and rightly divide the scriptures, that we may, may piece things together in a way that leads us to the, the full truth and understanding of the wonder of our salvation. Lord, I pray that you might bless each one. In Jesus' name, amen.